by keeping um, the IOU, so the, our quality metric, um, pretty high and use some other optimizations like several convolutions and different activation functions um, to um, be more computationally efficient, make the network smaller. And then we try to port it to the edge TPU. And this was the, let's say, the fun and the very intense part because this is everything but not trivial, even for small networks like the unit. So we used um, custom um, operations, for example, the um, a custom upscaling, otherwise it doesn't port to the edge TPU. And with this, we gain um, more or less a real, real time um, segmentation speed. So we can literally and provide everything in minutes instead of hours and immediately to, to the clinician, which is very important in the setting. And yeah, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Andreas. So we wait for the questions uh, until the next uh, two introductions. I so, just try to stop my... Here you go. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So we kindly ask the next Speaker to prepare the introductory slides, um, which is Alessandra Lumini. Are you here? Can you do you have the rights to share? Ah, okay. It's it's not her. It's uh, another. Oh, we do not hear you. You have to enable. You uh, you have to unmute. Ah, okay. Yeah, so you are the last author who is presenting. Not Alessandra. So. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Can I show a presentation? Mm -hmm. We can hear you. Yes. And you cannot see my screen yet. No. You should see my screen also. No. Now you should still see my screen. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I'm Gianluca Maguolo and um, uh, yeah, can you see the well, I'll just go. Um, my no worries. Baby... Take, 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 it takes two seconds. <laughs> well, don't worry. I... Time is also important. So I think you can already see everything. Then it's not so important. You just have to listen to me. So <laughs> that's most important. So the paper I'm presenting is Deep Activation Selection for Polyp Segmentation. And in this paper, we use a very simple but effective idea to segment polyp images from endoscopies, um, which is summarized in the next slide. Um, we create an effective ensemble using uh, ResNet50 as the backbone network of a deep lab V3 plus model. And uh, in our approach, um, we just substitute every activation layer um, of deep lab V3 with a new uh, random activation layer. And the idea is that uh, in this way, we create a new network architecture and that we can iterate this process multiple times. And since this process is stochastic, because we randomly select the activation function in every layer, we get uh, different architectures in every, in every step. So in this way, we managed to create a lot of different architectures whose performance is very similar to the, to the first um, deep lab V3 using ReLU as activation function. But the advantage is that um, these new um, uh, architectures uh, have independent predictions with respect to um, training multiple diverse um, uh, deep lab V3 always using ReLU. So the point is that we managed to create an ensemble and we managed to outperform um, a baseline uh, created um, using an ensemble of deep lab V3s using ResNet50 or ResNet101 as backbone networks. So this very simple idea that we tested on polyp segmentation uh, managed to outperform the baselines and to reach the second state of the art uh, in the literature, except from Hardinet uh, and SEG that uh, worked a little bit better but they used more data augmentation, so probably we also learned that the um, augmentation should be a more important aspect of our work in the future. So that's basically it. That's basically the paper. I'm happy to answer your questions later. Thank you very much um, for the nice introduction. So then we ask C3, Xavier Molana, to present 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. The previous video should screen, release. Uh, should release. The, yeah. Yes, we hear you. We do not see you. We hear you, and we see your slide. Okay. Don't see you. <laughs> uh, you see my my slide, the poster. Yes. Okay. So um, I am present myself. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Javier Morlana, PhD student of the University of Zaragoza. And in my work, uh, we tackle the problem of visual press recognition inside the colon, which would be a key element in SLAM systems that will enable robotization in colonoscopy procedures. Um, the problem of BPR is as follows. Um, given a database of places already visited, the goal of BPR is to retrieve database images depicting the same place as the query. Uh, we propose an end-to-end -end visual basic recognition network approach, trained specifically for the colonoscopy domain, where the place labeling is performed in a self-supervised manner by structured for motion algorithms. We cast the visual basic recognition problem as an image retrieval problem, using the network proposed in the work of Radenovic to convert every image into a global descriptor that represents the image and that can be compared against the others by means of the inner product. So we fine-tune the network using the contrastive loss, but we need a way to automatically um, cluster our data to get the examples. So we, we use this SFM algorithm that provides clusters of co-visible uh, images. Uh, with that, we, we get the positive examples for every query from the same cluster that the query is. And the negative examples for the for the contrastive loss come from different clusters. And in the experiments, uh, we saw the benefits of this fine tuning and and so that uh, this system would uh, would provide good candidates for Islam localization. Um, I would happy to to answer any question and thanks for having me in this nice conference. Yeah, thank you very much. So we start with the first discussion round and I see yes, already some questions here in the chat. Um, I might start with the first question to, um, to the first presenter. Mm, I'm very much interested in your clinical application of this. Now, now you reduced uh, the network size uh, significantly and you said you had a significant speed up. Uh, but what is actually your, your main goal in doing this for the laryngeal um, endoscopic image analysis? So, um, at which spot do you wanna, um, or during during a surgery or in a in a um, um, diagnostic setting? Um, when do yes. you wanna um, analyze these data sets? Actually, so um, so this is a very great question. So the thing is, if, um, if you have normally a polyp or something, uh, you just don't need this kind of technology because you just go in there um, with an endoscope and you see, okay, there's cancer, there's a polyp. But there are some, um, a fraction, um, which are functional disorders, um, which you just only see a difference um, in the vocal fold vibration, right? Mm -hmm. And then the vocal folds um, vibrate with 100 to 250 hertz. That means you need um, a high-speed environment um, to analyze um, this, um, to, to actually see this, and if you want to quantify this, um, we are um, using this glottal area, so this dark spot, what you saw mm -hmm. on the center, yeah. which is a very good proxy for the oscillation behavior, and with this, you can just measure this and this area over time, and then see if this is um, like nicely opening and closing um, in a very regular pattern, or if it's wavy or uh, disturbed, if it's symmetric or not. And with that, you can um, not only quantify the current behavior, but also have a, um, if you then apply some therapy to see how is the oscillation getting better over time. So you have like a, um, a chorus um, of quantitative parameters that you can measure to see if it's getting better or not. And currently, there's not such any method in the clinic at all, because no one is capable of dealing with this um, massive amounts of data. This is but but why do you want to run it on such a specific hardware? That's actually my question. Oh, um, on the edge GPU? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, because you can um, if you can just plug it in with a USB 3. So you can uh, buy any computer, any random laptop without a graphics card, and just plug it in with USB 3 and get the speed up without oh. having to deal with, okay, now you need an NVIDIA graphics card because you yes. have to run CUDA. It's yeah, just okay. you plug it in and it works. Okay. Bye okay. now. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, now we have um, another question to you. The demonstrated task had quite 
strong contrast between structures to be segmented and surrounding tissue? Do you think the specific nature may influence the results from Robert um, in the audience? Yeah, that's, that's another very good question. So um, when presenting these things, you for sure are kind of a little bit cherry pick the images you show that you see and that people realize, okay, this is the structure I'm interested in. But actually, in normal recordings, you don't have so nice clear cut. Uh, this is the nice tissue we are interested in. But you have like shadowing, you have artifacts, you have some uh, fibers or some some uh, you know debris which is in the way. So we actually train and evaluate on a, an open data set that we published previously called Bagels, and uh, where we have um, almost sixty thousand different images, and one is worse than the other. So to actually ensure that it works in a clinical environment where the contrast is not as dark as shown in, in these uh, figures. So it works actually okay. pretty reliable also on bad images. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope this answers the question and we move on to C2. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, I think we cannot discuss all questions that you're asking, but thanks for being so active here. Um, how is this? How is your ensemble method different from using dropout, something like um, Monte Carlo, etc. Dropout? Maybe you can quickly answer that. Yes, the main difference is that with dropout, you usually train one network and create the ensemble using that network and using dropout in different steps. In our case, you have to train different networks, and I don't have experimental data here because we use other baselines. But in our experience, uh, using dropout. Uh, uh, to create an ensemble is not um, an effective way to uh, beat uh, an ensemble of different networks training with Rilu. So, but that's just our experience. So I don't have experimental data on that. Are you also exper um, experimenting with different um, way to ensemble the results? You just said you were using the sum, but you can also, I don't know, look at uncertainties or whatever. I think there's a lot of things you can still still do on this. It's, uh, you can do a, a lot of things actually on yeah. these kind of experiments, but uh, we just tried to sum the output at the, at the end. So uh, all the experiments that we did actually uh, are in the paper. So we didn't mm -hmm. experiment anything more. Okay. So last uh, quick, very quick question to C3, then we have to really move to on. Uh, what exactly does cluster mean in your work? Is it a reconstructed point cloud generated from a subset of images? Uh, question comes from uh, Marianne. Yeah, that's not in the for, audience. Uh, this is for me, I think. For C3, yeah. Uh, cluster mean the, um, the system uh, from a subset of images that shares um, co-visibility. Uh, I mean, they are sharing the same place. Uh, a cluster is the... the... I think it means the location, the 3D location, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the 3D points it's that can be reconstructed from the subset of images that are watching the same place. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hope this answers the question. Otherwise, contact the authors uh, directly. And I guess we move on now to block two, uh, which includes um, the topics or the um, presentations C4 to C6, and this will be done by Lena. Yes, uh, so let's move on to, uh, to the second batch. Uh, the first talk is carbon footprint driven deep learning model selection for medical imaging. And I would be grateful for the speaker uh, to, to, to pronounce the name properly because I have no idea. I would definitely do it wrong. So maybe you can help me with this. Sure. Uh, can you hear me first? Yes. Uh, and can you also see my screen? Yes. All right. So, yes, my name is Raghavendra, so you can call me Raghav. Um, so, yeah, uh, thanks. I'm from the University of uh, Copenhagen. So I'll try to quickly uh, give an overview of uh, this short paper. Uh, so um, basically in this slide, I want to point out this particular graph. So between 2012 and 2018, the compute required for you know, most of the deep learning uh, based methods has grown 300,000 fold. And if you actually extrapolate now, and then if you look at newer models, this trend is still continuing. And it's uh, also specific to medical image analysis now where we're using bigger data sets, more complex models. So this compute also translates to increased you know, carbon footprint. And those of us who've trained these models, we also know that it's not just one model that you start out with, but then you want to explore a whole set of hyperparameters, et cetera. So the model selection is also you know, quite carbon resource intensive. Uh, 
Um, so, and and the objective with this work is not to just do model selection based on you know performance metrics like dice or you know some accuracy, but then to add an additional constraint, which is using you know the carbon foot uh, carbon footprint. And to that, what we do is we use some a tool that we put out last year called Carbon Tracker, which can predict the carbon footprint for a particular instance of a model run. And then I will not get into these details. You can check out in the uh, paper or, or uh, you know, look at uh, it in the poster. Uh, but the interesting thing we discovered was that when you want to get something like, uh, you know, we, we, with, with some of the models that we, uh, you know, explored here, one person dice improvement came at the cost of 1500 percent increase in carbon footprint and i don't think this is like a, a very good trade-off so the key idea with this work is to kind of use carbon footprint to kind of uh, perform model selection in a more reasonable way and this also helps for fairer model comparison because when people train on 200 gpus and then you only have access to one and then you know so you want to kind of add another burden so then carbon footprint is sort of agnostic to the amount of resource you have and i hope this trend sort of catches on uh, if you're interested then try out our tool uh, if you're also interested in doing neuroimaging, uh, you know, more sustainable, then also check out this link or stop at the poster. Thank you very much. I really like that you're looking at this important aspect. Um, C5 uh, is on surgical workflow recognition uh, with deep convolutional networks. And as far as I know, it will be presented by Bokai Zhang. Is that correct? Are you here? I see you in the... Yes, yes, yes. Uh... I'm trying to. Uh, are you are you able to see my screen? <clears throat> screen? Go ahead. Elevator. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Zhang Bokai. I'm from CSAS Johnson. We all know that video based automatic surgical workflow recognition is one of the key technologies to build systematic interventional systems for modern operating room. In this paper, we designed SWNet for surgical workflow recognition with international preserved channel separate network, multi stage temporal convolutional network, and the post processing algorithm named Prior Knowledge Noise Filtering. We developed a PKNF, this Prior Knowledge Noise Filtering algorithm, to consider three aspects, including phase order, phase incidence, and phase time. For the summary of our method for SWNet, we first divided the full surgery video into short video segments. Then we combined the segment level fees and use MS to initial phase segment. Finally, we apply PKNF, the noise filtering algorithm, to the initial results to get the final results. For both online and offline surgical workflow recognition in sleep gastrectomy, our SWNet outperformed to achieve state of art results. We show that asset has fewer over-segmentation errors and out-of-order predictions compared to other approaches. Our SWNet can locate surgical phase more accurately and can identify phase transaction better compared to other methods. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next, next speaker, Daniel Neymar. Train one, classify one, teach one. We're looking forward to your elevator pitch. Hey, uh, can you hear me? We hear you and we see your screen, not yet in presenter's mode. Cool, just a second. So, okay, let's see this one. Okay, so my name is Daniel and I'm from theater and the work that we worked on is called Trend on Classifying One, Teach One. And basically what we show in this paper is uh, cross-surgery transfer learning. Uh, in our case, we uh, presented it on surgical steps. Uh, so we this work is uh, divided into two pieces. The first one, we present a network that is more suitable to the transfer learning task. And the second part is basically uh, a self-unsupervised method to warm up this network. And it works, this method is, works also on more traditional ways like an LSTM. And uh, basically what we do is uh, we train a model on a cholecystectomy. And then we do a transfer learning to a right hemicolectomy, a sleeve gastrectomy, and a appendectomy. 
and we show uh, eventually that our method, our whole framework is uh, getting better results uh, in uh, recognizing surgical steps. So uh, if you're interested uh, uh, or have any question, uh, I'm here to answer them after. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now the papers are open for questions. Uh, in this session, we actually also got feedback from the study groups on the carbon footprint paper. Um, but since these are a few questions, I want to start with C5. There's a question in the chat from Javier. Can you explain again the offline online difference and why is uh, that the results from other methods such as LSEM, Techno, are different on the online, offline online comparison? Is it merely a post-processing step? No problem, no problem. So, um, A, there is a post-processing step for our SW now. So that's the reason you see uh, the online performance is uh, different from the offline performance. Uh, in the offline settings, we uh, apply a post-processing algorithm, PKNF, to the, uh, to the pipeline. So that's the reason for our IPCSN, MSTCN you know, workflow, um, that, that you kind of see uh, the offline result performs uh, better than online result. This is only one, uh, one reason. The other reason is uh, for offline, what we are giving to the network is the entire radius. So in the sense that the, the, uh, the network are able to see the full radius to make the decisions about uh, what is really happening in the surgery radio, so it can identify surgical face better. But for online, for uh, every one second, so we uh, let's say second uh, uh, time t. So we basically give uh, from time uh, one second to time t second all of the features to the network. So every one uh, and and only predict uh, on time t. So in this case, that uh, from uh, in, in online setup, not only it doesn't have a uh, uh, post-processing algorithm, but it only look at part of the uh, radius and only make one prediction for the current timeline uh, every time. So that's the reason you kind of see that usually online recognition results has a little bit worse results than, uh, 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 than offline results. Mm -hmm. um, next question to C4. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, the, the study group looked at this paper. All right. And, That's right. That's right. <laughs> and the, the general question that they came up with was, how did you actually calculate the carbon emission? Uh, the specific question is energy consumption versus heat. Uh, yes. So, um, I think we mentioned in, um, uh, in the paper that we use this tool called Carbon Tracker, uh, which was uh, a tool that we put out, uh, you know, last year. Uh, it's sort of like a Python package, which you can just embed in your training script. And then this script basically queries the instantaneous power consumption of uh, memory, CPU, and GPU. And this energy consumption is later, we also compare it with the local carbon intensity because we query the geographic location and then see at that particular point, what is the power source? Because for instance, um, in Denmark during the day, there's like, uh, you know, more power uh, requirements. So then more coal is burnt, but then as you know, progress through the day, just cleaner energy is, uh, you know, su sufficient. So then depending on the time of the day, the carbon intensity, uh, you know, also varies from country to country. So this is an API which queries this, uh, you know, instantaneously while the model is training. And then that is aggregated over every training epoch. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? Uh, well, I didn't come up with a question, but I, I, yeah. I think you explained yeah. well. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, sticking to the general uh, level, because you mentioned the trade-off between, for example, accuracy in terms of dyes versus uh, footprint. I mean, what would be your recommendation when we move forward, when we organize a challenge, for example? I mean, um, would we... That's actually a great that? question. Uh, so, so uh, because that's, yeah, like I said in the paper for the, the experiments that we did, 1% dies perhaps for some particular tasks is important. Uh, but then, you know, for a few other tasks, it might not be. But we also show this carbon footprint, sort of, you know, carbon budget constraint model. So where we say that, okay, if we only say, you know, this is the amount of carbon budget you have, so give me the best model. I think that would drive more innovative, you know, ideas than 
just cranking up all the knobs. Uh, so I think that is what I would, for instance, a challenge sort of a setup, that would be the constraint. So instead of saying like the runtime is like one hour, give me the best model. So we, we could say something like it's one kg carbon, you know, uh, for uh, emission for this particular task, give us the best model possible. So I think that would be like a better way of uh, performing model selection. So. Okay, so one more from the study group to you and then one uh, for the remaining paper. So do you think uh, just studying the depth of the network is enough, is the question. Sorry, which, uh, do you sorry. think just studying the depth of the network is enough? Uh, okay, so in this case, uh, no, I, it wasn't the depth that was uh, modified, it was the initial number of features. So we fixed the unit architect architecture as it was. So the unit architecture, the way it starts out is like you have an initial number of, uh, you know, uh, filters which are doubled every uh, you know downsampling operation. So which means you know we start out with four filters and then in uh, you go down up to four or five resolutions and by the end of it you end up with uh, you know 128 or whatever. So we did not change the depth, but then we changed the number of initial features, which meant the number of parameters were increasing because that's one way of thinking about complexity of models is to increase the number of parameters. And here we did not want to tweak the architecture. We froze the architecture, just changed the number of initial features. So that would kind of translate into increasing parameters. And, and I think that's where an interesting insight we also found was that it, just penalizing models because they are very complex might not be a good idea because a complex model might converge faster, but a simple model might take longer. So, but then it's using the GPU also for longer. So it, it gives like uh, in, interesting insights into how to choose models, I think. Yeah, a very interesting uh, topic. And I think the study group has uh, plenty of time in the poster session to dis discuss it. More. I, I look forward to that. Thanks. Thanks for um, the questions. One a question to C6. So you looked at cross-surgery transfer learning. Uh, did you also look at data from other domains, actually, or, or did you only look at surgical data? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. And we were thinking about it, but and yet there is a, a big difference between surgical footage and uh, non-surgical footage. So we do incorporate uh, the uh, what we call the out of body, the irrelevant segments when the camera is out of the the, the, the patient's uh, body. So we do incorporate it during training, but that's the only footage that is not purely surgical that we use. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... All other questions, please uh, use the poster sessions. Uh, and with this, I hand over to Sandy for the last one. Okay, so we directly proceed with presentation C7, uh, done by Aishik. Are you yeah. here? It's about COVID-19 COVID yeah, image case. Yeah. Yeah, can you see me? Yeah. Yeah, we see you. We don't see your slides yet. Okay, I will present it. Yeah, can you see the slides? Mm -hmm. It's loading. Yeah, it's loading. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, hello everyone. I am Oishik, uh, a PhD student from Stony Brook University Computer Science Department in USA. So, in this particular work, uh, we built a prognostic imaging model which can predict the severity of any disease at a future time point based on the trajectory in the first few days of treatment. We worked on a temporal chest sequence data set, chest x-ray, where there were more than one like chest x-rays per patient. So there were a sequence of images per patient, and we exploited that. Within our framework, we, as you can see, incorporated two different types of LSTMs. One was for exploiting the spatial information within a time point across an image, and another was for ex exploiting the temporal information across uh, different time points. And uh, for evaluation, we compared our method against two approaches. One baseline approach was based on transfer learning and another baseline approach was built using radiomic features. And uh, ultimately our goal was to provide some, say prior information to the physicians so that they can determine the timing and the duration of a treatment and better the clinical outcomes. Yeah, that's a brief overview of the paper. Mm -hmm. Thanks for listening, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. We move on to the next speaker, which is Andreas Kist again. 
Um, he will talk about feature-based image registration and structured light endoscopy this time. I'm sorry to bother you again. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm Andreas, I'm still with the Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen, Nuremberg, so it hasn't changed in the last 20 minutes. <laughs> and um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but this, this time I want to show you um, something slightly different. It's still, um, oh, I'm sorry. I am just in the I'm not at my home. <laughs> so um, sorry for the inconvenience. So in this um, this case, we are um, work, we are working on um, structured light endoscopy. So I'm still on laryngeal images. So we project um, a point source and so different dots onto it. And then the, the first thing we do is um, segment it. And um, if you want to 3D reconstruct um, the surface um, of the vocal um, vocal folds, um, we have to assign each laser uh, laser point to its um, position in the grid. However, this is done normally manually by lots and lots of students because we are lacking a, a full automatic task. And this is where we can um, come into play. We thought about a registration problem. And when we first tried like classical registration with ANDs or CMTK, it just doesn't work because it's intensity based. So we came up um, with a feature based um, custom loss and um, used a unit like architecture to um, compute um, a loss that is specifically um, working. Um, on our problem on this um, ident um, identity matching, which that um, that if I have a point that is moving, then that the walk um, one this distance will um, will be uh, minimized to its ideal grid position, and it works with um, affine transformations, with nonlinear transformations, and also with occlusions, very very good. And with the synthetic data, we get ninety nine percent accuracy, and with ex vivo data, so really experimental data, still ninety one. Um, percent, um, ninety-one percent accuracy, which is for us pretty amazing and sufficient to further continue um, to analyze our data fully automatically. Thank you very much, and I am happy to take questions later. It just thank you, excellent. Uh, we move on uh, to the last. Ah, he's here. Okay, um, just try to. That's great. Yeah, let me share my slide. Where is the what apps? I'm sorry. Here we go. Can you see my slide? No, we see you, we can hear you, but now it's loading. Yeah, we can see your slide now. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Oleg Zubacek from uh, Leiden University Medical Center. And I'm going to introduce to you our work on segmented mitochondria from uh, transmission electron microscopy, or briefly TEM data. So this research is a part of a large uh, collaborative project together with the Department of uh, Surgery of our medical center, in which our clinical partners uh, wanted to assess uh, the quality of renal transplant uh, based on the electron microscopy data. So for this, uh, the hypothesis is that it can be done uh, based on the appearance of the mitochondria being the power plants of the cell. So the primary goal of this research is to be able to segment mitochondria from highly heterogeneous uh, set of in-house stem data. And uh, to be even more specific in this particular work, uh, we wanted to assess if applying intensity standardization and correct methods, so both within a single image, a single set, or a large uh, collection of uh, different uh, images, can help uh, boost in the performance. So for this, uh, we developed a simple but very uh, effect efficient uh, bias correction method and showed that it's not only improved uh, homogeneity within the images, but it also had a positive uh, effect on the training performance on uh, our data. And then finally, we also analyzed which uh, intensity standardization methods uh, work best for our data. And for this, we trained the network on all five data sets combined, and we were able to get quite reasonable performance. Thank you for your attention. OK, uh, thank you very much um, for the nice introductions. Um, we start with some, or I start with a question to um, to presentation number seven, uh, the COVID presentation. Um, my question is: How important are 
actually the correspondences between the single image regions that you um, yeah. somehow combine in different time steps. So is uh, um, do you see major problems if they're not good aligned? And how influential are the number of time points per patient? I guess you have a different number of time points you are mentioning yeah. per patient. And maybe third question, um, what is the actual input during the prediction stage in your, um, that's what, what I was asking myself. What is the actual input into the network in the prediction stage? Is it just one time step or is it also several time steps? Okay, so that's a very good question. First of all, like uh, as you wanted to, uh, the last question, uh, we input like, for example, seven images were available for a patient. We input the first six images and we were trying to predict the severity scores on the seventh image and we did some more experiments where we varied the number of time points which we're using as input like mm -hmm. say less number of time points and trying to see how good the scores were on a future mm -hmm. time point mm -hmm. and uh, second of all uh, like uh, the correspondences between the images was also my question yeah the correspondence between the images they were very much important because uh, we can see that uh, it has been seen that COVID lung infiltrates, they progress within a particular image in a top to bot in a bottom to top fashion across the lung lobes. And also across different time points, it may enter a peak where the lung infiltrates become denser and then they become like uh, less dense. Correspondence between the images were important and that's why we divided the images into six different grids, which I talked in talk in the overview. And that's why we adopted a more granular approach and we had six different grids and in future we are trying to adopt a more alignment network based on like special transformer networks to like uh, align the images like which will perform mm -hmm. the case of registration okay yeah, yeah. thank you very much uh, we then move on to the study group questions uh, because we received some questions from the study group for um, presentation number eight and nine a uh, short question to you, Andreas. Um, please describe the experimental setup. How did you create your ex vivo setup? Um, or also was wanted to ask you, have you actually used clinical data for it? I guess no, right? This is uh, all done on phantoms and ex vivo data. No, this is, uh, oh, am I up stage? Otherwise, you, here I go. We hear you. Um, That's fine. Great. Um, so it's an ex vivo setup. So we have um, actually calf um, laryngus, uh, which were mo uh, mounted um, kind of a breadboard, and then you just mm -hmm. um, use like um, air, pressured air to make, um, make them vibrate. And then mm -hmm. you have um, the endoscope um, or the laser shine from above. So this is a little bit an artificial environment where we recorded the data. Um, yeah. So we are, um, we have better control over um, everything. So the aim is for sure to bring it into the clinic, which is currently um, part um, of a project which is under the way. Is, but... is the setup of um, your structured light endoscope very big, so that it cannot be? Um, easily used so in... it, it it is in it, it is. What is happening here? Um, so this is um, it is. Relatively big in, uh, in, ter um, in terms of um, your ex vivo setup, but it's relatively small um, in the unit which you then apply for the patient. It's a little bit better. So if you have a rigid endoscope, which is around about 10 millimeters in diameter, you just add another five to seven millimeters diameter for the mm -hmm. laser unit. It's mm -hmm. just a thicker endoscope, which you um, mm -hmm. do this um, in vivo in the patient, mm -hmm. which is still, let's say, not so comfortable because um, already the, the larger endoscope um, um, you have some some problem um, problems uh, um, with swallowing and whatever, mm. but um, but it does work in vivo as well, but um, you have less control over it if you want uh, want to um, get first the anal um, analysis right. Okay, okay. Now uh, to be fair, we have another question to the last speaker, and then we we uh, we have to close the session. Um, so also a question from the study group. Um, the question was, it is surprising that the histogram equalization is deteriorating the results. Why is that? Yeah, that was also surprising to us. It was just, uh, we, we didn't find a good explanation for that. 
but then uh, so we saw that uh, uh, also like when we used other methods like uh, exact histogram specification and also in combination or without the prior bias correction that method was performing uh, much better so my one explanation of that might be because uh, mostly most publications that we have uh, seen they were for the same data which is slightly different and then the appearance of the data is quite different so we just just blame it on the difference uh, in the uh, between the intrinsic difference between them and same data but we couldn't find any other explanations for that mm -hmm. okay i hope this is a satisfying answer anyway um with this is was our last question now we are a little bit behind in time and that's why we have to close the session um of course, if you have burning questions, feel free to visit the presenting authors at the poster presentations. And we thank the audience to um, engage here and to ask questions in the chat. That was really nice. And we wish you a nice uh, rest of the of the meeting conference in virtually in Lübeck. And hopefully see you next year in, in, in presence then. Yeah, this room will actually close. So please uh, take advantage of the poster room. So it's really nice to engage with and discuss the technical details. I think. Have a good rest of the conference. Bye.